Okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of A Vision for You. Today is Sunday, October 5th, 2014. My name is Leah, and I'm your moderator this morning. The share ID for Friday, October 3rd, is 6930. That's 6930. This morning, A Vision for You presents Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. The big book teaches us we have a twofold illness, the allergy of the body and the obsession of the mind. The allergy of the body is a very bad problem. However, the big book teaches us we have a problem worse than that. The big book says it's our main problem. We've got a mental problem. We've got a problem with our mind. Here to speak to us this morning about the greater aspect of our disease is Harlan. Harlan is a recovered compulsive overeater from Scottsdale, Arizona. He is a dedicated servant of Overeaters Anonymous, intensively working with other compulsive overeaters and carrying the message of recovery. And welcome to the line, Harlan. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Leah? Great. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Harlan. I'm a compulsive overeater. I'm glad you guys are here this morning. Otherwise, I'd be sitting here talking to myself and my dog. Uh, Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. And when we look at the title of the chapter, more about alcoholism, we might as well call the chapter more truth about alcoholism because that's exactly what we're going to be examining this morning because the entire chapter is really dedicated to the thinking that precedes the first compulsive bite, the first drink. That is the crux of the problem. And we're going to look at the thinking because when everything is boiled down, it is really a not a drinking problem, but a thinking problem. And the twist of the mind drives us irresistibly into the food. It is the twist of the mind that gets triggered when the things like emotions, not things, but emotions build up to the level where our brain just feels like it's just not right. If there's the equilibrium has been thrown off, and so our mental twist will throw us into the food in an attempt to get the effect. Dr. Silkworth tells us that we drink because of the effect. What's the effect? The effect is that sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly from eating the food. All food, no. Not uh, certain foods, but Kit Kat bars and French fries and milkshakes and ice cream will give us that instant delivery of that sense of ease and comfort that comes right there when we eat those foods. So if we cannot eat those foods because we have the physical allergy, which makes it impossible for us to stop once we've started, and we can't keep from eating those foods because of the mental twist, we are therefore powerless over food and our lives are unmanageable. So what we're going to be examining this morning is the thinking that precedes the first compulsive bite. And as we look on page 30, we're going to see that most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Now, this idea that I'm bodily and mentally different from my fellows is what is going to be capitalized on by the entire dieting industry? What is the image that they're going to sell me? What is in a few months, as soon as the holidays are upon us, we're going to see commercial after commercial to join this gym and join this diet center and join this, this, this and that, the, the Nutrisystems and all these various things. Why are they going to, what are they going to use to hook me in? They're going to use it if I get down to a certain weight that I can eat and be like everyone else. And isn't that the dream that we can be like everyone else? And isn't that the obsession that we have that if I got down to a certain weight, then I would be normal? And I have a twist of the mind and an allergy of the body. And those things will make it so that I cannot eat like a normal person. I will never have that relationship with food. Unless I have a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps, I will not be able to fight food. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinking drinker. Sorry, 
The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Now, when we see this illusion, what is an illusion? An illusion is something that a magician uses. An illusion is something that someone uses to distract us from reality. And this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. And I look around and I look at my life and I look at the lives of many, many other people. And they went out of this world, death by Dorito. And I was headed out death by Dorito because I didn't know how to live in this world. I didn't want to live in this world. I felt ill-equipped to live in this world because no matter what, I, all I ever wanted to be was thin, but all I ever wanted to do was eat. We learned that we had to concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe beat this point to death, but I, it's very important that we see this. I feel that we were alcoholics, and that means that I have an allergy of the body and a twist of the mind that makes it impossible for me to eat like a normal person. This is the first step in recovery. Now, we are in a 12-step program, but the first three steps of the program are not working steps. They are conclusions of the mind and the conclusion of the mind that is necessary to work step one. The only step we must work perfectly is one. The conclusion of the mind must be for me that I am powerless over food. And when I say that word powerless, I kept thinking in my mind willpower. That's a dieting term. It has nothing to do with that. If I can't eat because of the allergy and I cannot keep from eating because of the twist of the mind, I am powerless over food. And what we're going to do through this program is we're going to find the necessary power that is going to make it possible for me to stop eating that way. Because if I can't do this myself, I must find that power, and that power must come from God. That power must come from a higher power, the spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. Continuing, the delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. And when the big book wants to tell me something, it doesn't just tell it to me once. It tells it to me several times, many times. And here's that same point from the previous paragraph reinforced yet again that the idea or the, excuse me, the delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And this pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization is a, is a valley of my emotions. It is a hell of my emotions that occurred when after successfully dieting down for a period of time, I would inevitably go back into the food and I would start gaining weight or the worst horror imaginable is that someone would see me eating food that absolutely was going to kill me and they would catch me and I had no explanation for it. And that, that, those are the moments when I felt most humiliated. I felt most defeated because in spite of everything I said to them, in spite of everything I did with every reason in the world not to be eating those foods, there I was yet again. No wonder I couldn't trust myself. No wonder it says in the doctor's opinion we lose confidence. I could never trust me. And it wreaked havoc on my emotions that I would turn my will and my life over to the care of other human beings and try to get them to control me, try to get them to raise me, try to get them to, to bail me out because I couldn't do it myself and I lost any kind of confidence I had in me. I knew I could trust you, but I knew I couldn't trust me. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any uh, considerable period, we get worse, never better. And this is a very misunderstood concept, the progressive illness. We hear this at meetings and we say it at meetings, but what does it mean? What it means is the older I get, <clears throat> the more pervasive the illness gets. Because the older I get, 
I lose the ability to burn the food in my meta- with my metabolism. As I get older, my body starts to slow down. I'm 60 years old. I'm experiencing that, and I've been experiencing that for decades. As I age, my body slows down. And as I age, the knee pain and the hip pain and the back pain and the ankle pain and the hand pain and the neck pain all get worse and worse as my skeletal system, as my muscular system starts to bog down and it's exasperated by the fact that, you know, if you're overweight, it exasperates that situation. And as the physical pain reaches the brain, the brain will inevitably say, I know how to take care of this. I'll send him into the food. I'll have him eating ice cream. I'll have him eating potato chips or Kit Kat bars, and that'll take away the pain. And it does for about seven seconds. But by eating the Kit Kat bars, I trigger the physical allergy. I pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to eat that way again. And I will repeat that cycle over and over and over again, the mind telling me that the food makes sense and the body ensuring that it does not. And as I pack more food on my body, it exasperates the knee pain and the leg pain and the hip pain. And as the pain reaches the brain, I eat yet again, exasperating the situation. And the more I exasperate the situation, the more I eat. The more I eat, the more I exasperate the situation. So it's a vicious cycle. And this is the mechanism that the food uses to kill me. Because the more I eat, the worse it gets. The worse it gets, the more I eat. And unless I am acted upon by a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps, this cycle is unbreakable by earthly mechanisms. There is no earthly thing that is going to break this, this cycle. And we're going to see this morning in, the, in Jim, the man of 30, Fred, the jaywalker, we're going to see that earthly conditions have no bearing on breaking the cycle. Some of us are convinced that it will, but we're going to see today that it won't. We are like men and women, bottom of 30, who have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Neither, <clears throat> excuse me, does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every imaginable remedy. In some instances, there has been brief recovery, followed always. The key word here in this sentence is always by a still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there's no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish it, but it hasn't done so yet. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they are in that class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. Here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking beer only, limiting the number of drinks, never drinking alone, never drinking in the morning, drinking only at home, never having it in the house, never drinking during business hours, drinking only at parties, switching from scotch to brandy, drinking only natural wines, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job, taking a trip, not taking a trip, swearing off forever with or without a solemn oath, taking more physical exercise, reading inspirational books, going to health farms and sanitariums, accepting voluntary commitment to asylums, we could increase the list ad infinitum. And how many of us have have eaten the cookie because it's vegan? And how many of us have eaten the cake because it's it's, uh, vegetarian? And how many of us have eaten the pastry or we've eaten the food because it's organic or it's kosher or it's whatever it is? We convince ourselves that this is how it's going to work, that this is going to be okay. I made this just for you. Well, I can't turn it down. We wouldn't do that if it was strychnine. We wouldn't do that if it was whatever, but we'll do it with food. Those are not reasons to eat for me. Those are justifications, excuses. We do not like to pronounce any individual as alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. 
step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Try to drink and stop abruptly. Try it more than once. It will not take long for you to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. It may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. Though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who show definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period because of an overpowering desire to do so. Here is one. Now, the paragraph that I just read about stopping in time, I don't think that that really applies to me. I have been obsessed with food from the minute I was born. Food and weight and size have been the topic of conversation in my life or around my life when when I was with my parents as a young child, from the time I was a toddler, from the time I was a baby. But we're going to look at the man of 30 in the next in the next few paragraphs here. And let's take a look at him and let's see what we can glean out of here. A man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. He was nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business but saw that he would get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man, he remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55. After a successful and happy business career, then he fell victim to a belief which practically every alcoholic has. Now, think back to your dieting career. Maybe you had a day, a week, whatever it is, six months, a year of successful dieting that his, getting back here, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. Out came his carpet slippers in a bottle. In two months, he was in a hospital, puzzled and humiliated. He tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital meantime. Then gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether and found he could not. Every means of solving his problem, which money could buy, was at his disposal. So it wasn't a matter of poverty. It wasn't a matter of not having the money or having the resources. Every attempt failed. Every attempt failed. So as wealthy as he was, as successful as he was, his attempts to curb his illness failed. Though a robust man at retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. As he wasn't drinking, he was still getting older. As he wasn't drinking, he was still getting older, and his, his, his ability to handle the alcohol, or in our case, handle the food, was diminishing every day. We've all heard this. We've, we've heard this for as long as we've been in OA. We've heard, yeah, while I'm in here, my disease is doing push-ups in the parking lot. And we've all heard that. What does that mean? That this is a progressive illness. And no matter how long my recovery is, I still have to work the steps every day without ceasing because my disease is getting worse and worse, so my recovery has to be stronger and stronger and stronger. And as the disease starts to starts to progress every day, my recovery must go in the other direction every single day. This case contains a powerful lesson, page 33. Most of us have believed that if we remain sober for a long stretch, we could thereafter drink normally. But here is a man who at 55 years found he was just where he had left off at 30. We have seen the truth demonstrated again and again. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we are in a short time as bad as ever. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any, of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. I love that imagery of the lurking notion. And when I hear that lurking notion, I think of Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, the monster is always lurking. They're never walking upright like the hero. They're never just walking around. They're kind of lurking about. And I love that imagery of the big book because that's exactly how my disease is, kind of lurking around, trying to get me to eat a Kit Kat bar. Young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think they can stop as he did on their own willpower. We doubt if many of them can do it because none will really want to stop. 
and hardly one of them, because of the peculiar mental twist already acquired, will find he can win out. And that's where that term mental twist comes from, is page 33. Several of our crowd, men of 30 or less, had been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless as those who had been drinking 20 years. To be gravely affected, one does not necessarily have to drink a long time nor take the quantity some of us have. This is particularly true of women. Potential female alcoholics often turn into the real thing and are gone beyond recall in a few years. Certain drinkers who would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. We who are familiar with the symptoms see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere but try to get them to see it. As we look back, we feel we had gone on drinking many years beyond the point where we could have quit on our own willpower. On our, <clears throat> excuse me. If anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let him try leaving liquor alone for one year. If he is a real alcoholic and far advanced, there is scant chance of success. In the early days of our drinking, we occasionally remained sober for a year or more, becoming serious drinkers again later. Though you may be able to stop for a considerable period, and you may yet be a potential alcoholic, we think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. Some of us will be drunk the day after making the, their resolution, most of them within a few weeks. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We are assuming, of course, that the reader wants to stop. Now, that sentence should be tattooed on the inside of my eyelids. We are assuming, of course, that the reader wants to stop. If we remember back to Bill's story, when Evie brings Bill the spiritual solution, he says, Bill says, he tried to give this to me, he tried to carry this to me if I cared to have it. We can't make you willing. We can't make you want to do this. There's one ingredient that the compulsive overeater must bring to the table willingness. We cannot make you want to do this program. What do most people do in their life? They do what they want to do. They, they do what they want to do. So if I have any ideas on how I'm going to amend this or do it my way, I'm dead. I must surrender. I must say, my way sucks. Please take my hand. Tell me what it is you want me to do. I'll do that. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Many of us felt <clears throat> excuse me, that we had plenty of character. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. This utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the, the necessity or the wish. And what that asking me to come back to is the built-in forgetter, the mental blank spot. And the mental blank spot is the thing in my head that will not allow me to remember the horror of the food. When I was a little boy and when you were little kids, before you were about two years old, you touched something that was way, way, way too hot, way too hot. Maybe it was a candle. Maybe it was a stove, a pot, a pan, a plate, a fireplace. Something that you touched that was way too hot. And when you touched it, your brain registered something in it indelibly that we don't touch hot things because that's going to hurt us. And every single time since that day that you have burned yourself, it was always an accident. And you know that I could not come to your house right now with a million dollars in cash and ask you to light your stove and put your hand in the fire. For a million dollars, your brain will not allow you to do that because your brain functions normally where it's going to hurt you with, with fire. Not so with food. Not so. Your brain has a built-in forgetter called the mental blank spot. You wouldn't stab yourself with a knife unless you were sick, unless you were masochistic. masochistic. You wouldn't put your hand in the fire. And yet Doritos and Kit Kat bars have burned me and mangled me 
and altered my life, and they have degraded me and emasculated me and deformed me physically and deformed me mentally, and yet if I do not do the steps, I will eat that food again. Now, that's plain insanity. And the insanity of what this is is exactly what we're going to examine. Bottom of 34, how then shall we help the, our readers determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us? The experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful, but we think we can render an even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps to the medical fraternity. So we shall describe some of the mental states which precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem, and it's also the purpose of this chapter. What sort of thinking dominates an, al an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree, which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon. Why does he? Of what is he thinking? Now, I love old Jim. Our first example is a friend we shall call Jim. His, he has a, <clears throat> excuse me. This man has a charming wife and family. He inherited a lucrative automobile agency. He, has a, he had a commendable World War record. He is a good salesman. Everybody likes him. He's an intelligent man, normal so far as we can see, except for a nervous disposition. He did no drinking until he was 35. In a few years, he became so violent when intoxicated that he had to be committed. On leaving the asylum, we came, we came into contact. He came into contact with us. So here's Jim. He's got a good business. He's got a good family. He's got friends. And you think in your mind you drink because you don't have any of those things. But yet let's look at Jim and let's see that armed with the family, armed with friends, armed with a business, armed with money, th page 35, we told him what we knew of alcoholism. What did they know of alcoholism? Well, they told him of the twist of the mind that drives him into the, into the alcohol in search of the effect. And they told him of the physical allergy, which makes it impossible for him to stop. And the answer we had found, the answer they had found is step two. If they told him about step one, then they told him about step two and the spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. He made a beginning. In chapter five, we're going to learn that step three is both a beginning and a decision. So he's taken steps one, two, and three. And you see a lot of people in OA, and I was one of them. I came in, I potchkeed around with a few of the steps, but I didn't continue on with the work. And if you don't continue with the work, what happens? Let's find out. His family was reassembled and he began to work as a salesman for the business he had lost through drinking. That's got to be pretty humbling. I own a business and I work by myself now. I used to have 30 employees. I sure as heck wouldn't want to work at that company uh, as an employee after owning it. That's got to be very humbling for poor Jim. All went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. How do we enlarge our spiritual life? By working 4 through 12 on a daily basis, by working the rest of the steps every single day. To his consternation, he found himself drunk a half a dozen times in rapid succession. On each of these occasions, we worked with him, reviewing carefully what had happened. He agreed he was a real alcoholic and in a serious condition. He knew he faced another trip to the asylum if he kept on. Moreover, he would lose his family for whom he had a deep affection. So he's got every reason in the world not to drink. Top of page 36, yet he got drunk again. We asked him to tell us exactly how it happened. This is his story. I came to work on Tuesday morning. I read this book for years. What do you mean you came to work on Tuesday morning? Where were you Monday? So he walked in there and the boss might have said to him, by the way, Jim, where were you yesterday? I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. So he's starting to develop a resentment. And I don't know about you listening to this, but when I have a resentment, my brain says, eat the Kit Kat bars. Then I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. On the way, I felt hungry, so I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. Now, this is just plain insanity. And if we remember that the big book tells us things many times, and we look back to Bill's story, he went into the cafe to telephone. They didn't have a phone at the jewelry store. They didn't have a phone at the florist. They didn't have a phone at the 
at the uh, Undertaker. He had to go to the cafe to make a call. And here's a guy that wants to get a sandwich, but he's got to stop off at a place where they have a bar. He was half drunk before the liquor went in his mouth. He was setting himself up to get drunk because he had a resentment, and that was driving the mental twist. Back to page 36. I had no intention of drinking. I just thought I would get a sandwich. I also had the notion that I might find a customer for a car at this place, which was familiar, for I had been going to it for years. I had eaten there many times during the months I was sober. I sat down at a table and ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. Still no thought of drinking, but yet he's sitting in a place where they have a bar. I ordered another sandwich and decided to have another glass of milk. Suddenly, boom, right now, suddenly the thought crossed my mind, excuse me, and if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. Now, this is plain insanity. I ordered a whiskey and poured it into the milk. Now, why did he order a whiskey and pour it into the milk? Because of the mental twist. He ordered the whiskey because his mind didn't feel right because he had a resentment brewing from the words he had had with the boss. Now, let's see what causes him to take the 20th drink. I vaguely sensed I was not being any too smart, but felt reassured I was taking the whiskey on a full stomach. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. Now, this is plain insanity. And what's causing him to continue to do this? Because once the first whiskey entered his system, he triggered the physical allergy. The allergy is the adverse abnormal reaction that makes it impossible for him to stop once he has started. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. The allergies got him now. He's in the grips of the allergy, the craving. Thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. Here was the threat of commitment, the loss of family and position, to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering, which drinking always caused him. The key word in that sentence is always. Not sometimes, always. Every single time I walk on broken glass, my feet get cut every time. He had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic, yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in favor of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with, work, with milk. Whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? You may think this is an extreme case. To us, it is not far-fetched. For this kind of thinking has been characterized of every single one of us. We have sometimes reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences, but there was always, always is the key word, curious mental phenomenon that parallel with our sound reasoning, there inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink. Our sound reasoning failed to hold us in check. The insane idea won out. Next, time, next day, we would ask ourselves in all earnestness and sincerity how it could have happened. And how many mornings of my life did I wake up and I would swear to God with tears in my eyes that I am not going to eat whatever today. How many times did I cry into the night, God, please stop me. Stop me, God. I can't live like this anymore. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I'm not alive. I'm not a human. I exist in this world, and all I'm doing is getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter. And yet every single day, as God is my witness, I would swear I'm not going to eat this today. And there I was eating it yet again. Why in the world would I do that? Somebody very wise said to me years ago, Harlan, if you did to your friends what you do to yourself, would you have any? I wouldn't treat anyone like that. I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. And yet day after day after day after day, I took the one life I was given by God and I flushed decades of it down the toilet in search of the high of a Kit Kat bar. I'll never get one second of that time back. 
but I'm not going to live that way for one more second of my life. Today, I have freedom. I don't live like that anymore, and I don't eat like that anymore. And if you're listening to this, whether it's on recording or on the phone this morning, work these steps. Stop trying to diet with group support. Stop trying to just stay on a diet in a way and work the steps. Have a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. Test God. See if you can find him wanting. See if you can find his power lacking. I know that you will not be successful in seeing his power lacking. Work these steps. I'm begging you. In some circumstances, we have gone out deliberately to get drunk, feeling ourselves justified by nervousness, anger, worry, depression, jealousy, or the like. But even in this type of beginning, we are obliged to admit that our justification for a spree was insanely insufficient in the light of what always happened. The key word there is always. Thank you. We now see that when we began to drink deliberately instead of casually, there was little serious or effective thought during the period of premeditation of what the terrific consequences might be. I do not focus in on the consequences of eating these things. I only focus in on the fact that I'm going to get that buzz. I'm going to give the world the finger. I deserve this. I'm going to eat this. Nobody's going to tell me no. Nobody's going to try to control me. And besides, and this is part of what my brain will tell me, this is part of that mental blank spot. I'm going to eat these O. Henry bars today because I'm never going to eat them again tomorrow because tomorrow is going to be the day when I'm going to stay on my diet. So I might as well eat all the ice cream in North America today because tomorrow there won't be any left, but I'm not going to be eating it anyway. So ha, 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 on them. Our behavior is as absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with a passion, say, for jaywalking. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. He enjoys himself for a few years in spite of a friendly, a friendly warnings. Up to this point, you would label him as a foolish chap, having queer ideas of fun. Luck then deserts him, and he is slightly injured several times in succession. You would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. Presently, he is hit again, and this time has a fractured skull. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He tells you he has decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks, he breaks both legs. On through the years, this conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful to keep off the streets altogether. Finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce, and he is held up to ridicule. He tries every known means of getting the jaywalking idea out of his head. He shuts himself up in an asylum, hoping to mend his ways. But the day he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? You may think our illustration is too ridiculous, but is it? We who have been through the ringer have to admit, if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. However intelligent we may have been in other respects, where alcohol has been involved, we have been strangely insane. It's strong language, but isn't it true? Some of you are thinking, yes, what you tell us is true, but it doesn't fully apply. We admit we have some of these symptoms. We are not gone to the extremes you fellows did, nor are we likely to, for we understand ourselves so well after what you have told us that such things cannot happen again. We have not lost everything in life through drinking, and we certainly do not intend to. Thanks for the information. Kiss my patoot. No. (laughs) But the bottom line is you see this and you've probably done this in your life. Now that I have the information, now that I know the score, lead me to my own devices and I'll take care of it. Well, what did we see in Bill's story up and down the line? That self, He said, surely this was the answer. Self-knowledge would fix it. But it was not for the frightful day came when I drank once more. All of you listening to this know what foods are killing you, what amounts of foods are killing you, and if you're still eating them, you're in the grips of a powerful, powerful progressive illness. And if you're not eating them and you're not doing the steps, you're dieting with food support. And I extend my hand again to you. Please join us and work these steps. There is a vast difference between recovery and dieting with food support. In AA, they call it a dry drunk. And here we call it a diet with groups, dieting with food support. 
back to page 39. That may be true of certain non-alcoholic people who, though drinking foolishly and heavily at the present time, are able to stop or moderate because their brains and bodies have not been damaged as ours were, but the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. This is a point we wish to emphasize and re-emphasize to smash home upon our alcoholic readers as it has been revealed to us out of bitter experience. Let us take another illustration. Now, we're going to look at Fred. Fred is not living under a park bench. Fred is a successful guy. Let's look at it. Fred is a partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good. He has a fine home, is happily married, and the father of promising children of college age. He has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there was a successful businessman, it is Fred. To all appearance, he is a stable, well-balanced individual, yet he is alcoholic. So he's blowing the myth here again that alcoholism or compulsive overeating sets upon a person because conditions make it so. That is not true. It doesn't matter what our mothers did, our fathers did, our husbands did, our wives did. It doesn't matter. We have the illness or we don't have the illness. We first saw Fred about a year ago in a hospital where he had gone to recover from a bad case of jitters. It was his first experience of this kind, and he was much ashamed of it. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. We see lots of nerve resters in OA, don't we? The doctor intimated strongly that he may be worse than he realized. For a few days, he was depressed about his condition. He, came, he made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. He made up his mind to quit drinking altogether means he went on a diet. Very good. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could not do so in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic. That means he won't take step one, much less accept the spiritual remedy for his problem. If you don't take step one, you don't need to take step two. We told him, <clears throat> top of 40, what we knew of alcoholism. Again, when they say that they told him what they knew of alcoholism, they're telling him about the twist of the mind and the allergy of the body. He was interested and conceded that he had some of the symptoms, but he was a long way from admitting that he could do nothing about it himself. He was positive that his humiliating experience plus the knowledge he had acquired would keep him sober the rest of his life. Self-knowledge would fix it. And when the big book wants to tell us something, remember, it doesn't tell it to us once. It tells it to us many times. Bill Wilson, in his story, thought that self-knowledge would fix it. But he wasn't. And he thought that he'd get scared sober. He says, fear sobered me for a bit. We remember reading that in Bill's story. But it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. And here is Fred. And he's drinking after a period of being scared sober, and he's going to drink after self-knowledge. Let's see where we go here. We heard no more of Fred for a while. One day we were told that he was back in the hospital. This time he was quite shaky. He soon indicated he was anxious to see us. Oh, now he's anxious to see him, is he? The story he told is most instructive, for here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking, who exhibited splendid judgment and determination in all his other concerns, yet he was flat on his back nevertheless. And there are going to be people this morning and people listening to this on the recording that have done amazing things in their life. You've accomplished things as groups and individuals that would astound most people. Some of you have raised families. Some of you have embarked on very arduous careers, and you've mastered them beautifully. But there's one thing you cannot do if you have this illness. You cannot stop eating based on self-knowledge, and you cannot stop eating based on self-control, and you cannot keep from eating because you now want to. And Bill tells us in his story where alcohol is concerned, the will is amazingly weakened. Let him tell you about it. Back to page 40. I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism, and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. I rather appreciated your ideas about the subtle insanity which precedes the first drink, but I was confident it could not happen to me after what I had learned. 
I reasoned I was not so far advanced as most of you fellows, that I had been usually successful in licking my other personal problems, that I would therefore be successful where you men failed. I felt I had every right to be self-confident, that it would not, that it would be an only, let me get that right, that it would be only a matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on guard. In this frame of mind, I went about my business, and for a time, all was well. I stayed on my diet, right? I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard work of a simple matter. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. I had been out of town before during this particular dry spell, so there was nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. I ordered a cocktail in my meal. What caused him to order the first cocktail? The mental twist. Now that he's got the first one inside of him, let's see where he goes from there. Then I ordered another cocktail. Now he's got it inside of him, and the physical allergy has taken over. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. I wonder what he was thinking about on the walk, but I bet you it was drinking more and drinking more and drinking more. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed, so I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty next morning. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I know little of where I went or what I said and did. Then came the hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all. The mental blank spot had him in its grip. He had not thought of the consequences at all. My, my, my. I had commenced to drink as carelessly as though the cocktails were ginger ale. I now remembered that my alcoholic friends had told me how they prophesied that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. They said that though I did raise a defense, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink, like it's a day with a Y in it or a month without an X in it. Well, just that did happen and more, for what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. wouldn't it matter if it did. I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. I had never been able to understand people who said that a problem had them hopelessly defeated. I knew then. It was a crushing blow. And here he's talking about the mental blank spot because it was explained to him about the blank spot being the built-in forgetter. Two of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. They grinned, which I didn't like so much, and then asked me if I thought myself alcoholic and if I were really licked this time. I had to concede both propositions. They piled on me heaps of evidence to the effect that an alcoholic mentality such as I had exhibited in Washington was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozen. This process snuffed out the last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself. Then they outlined the spiritual answer and program of action which a hundred of them had followed successfully. The spiritual answer is the steps. The program of action is the steps. It's the steps. It's not the tools. It's not going to three meetings a week and calling in your food and making three outreach calls. Those are great things. Those are, I'm not knocking those things. But those things alone are not the answer. They are not the spiritual answer and program of action. The program of action is taking the steps, which a hundred of them had followed successfully. Though I had only been a nominal churchman, their proposals were not intellectually hard to swallow. But the program of action, though entirely sensible, was pretty drastic. It meant I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out the window. That was not easy. But the moment I made up my mind to go through with the process, I had the curious feeling that my alcoholic condition was relieved as, in fact, it proved to be. <laughs> Excuse me. What changes in recovery 
everything, everything, everything changes. The three things you'll notice that change right away in recovery are going to be my playground, my playmates, and my play toys. Let me say that again. My playgrounds, my playmates, and my play toys. Those things will change. I'm not going to be hanging around the restaurant anymore. I'm not going to be buying waitresses birthday cards because I know them so well and they know me so well. There are restaurants in Chicago where I was born and raised where I could go into that restaurant on any given day, pull into the parking lot because I knew the schedule so well. I knew who was scheduled to work that day and if, they had, if anybody had called in sick, I would know it and I knew who took their place. That's how well I knew these people. Why? Because the restaurant became the the focal point of my existence. It's not a focal point of my existence at all anymore. I don't binge with binge buddies. I don't pay attention to what the special of the day is at this place or that. I don't care. I don't care. Bottom of 42. Quite as a... Quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles, what are the spiritual principles, the steps, would solve all my problems. You may be sitting there listening. I'm working the steps, and my mother-in-law is still a witch, and I'm working the steps, and I still have a month left at the end of my money, and on and on and on, because we love that, don't we, self-pity? What we have to see is that by working the steps, it may not change the fact, but the attitude is more important than the fact And my attitude is such that I expect more miracles. I expect God to come in and somehow move me through the muck that my ego has caused me in my life. I have since been brought into a way of living infinitely more satisfying and I hope more useful than the life I lived before. Here's some beautiful promises. You don't have to wait for page 83 to get promises. Listen to this. My old manner of life was by no means a bad one, but I would not exchange its best moments for the worst I have now. I would not go back to it, even if I could. Fred's story speaks for itself. We hope it strikes home to thousands like him. We had, he had felt only the first nip of the ringer. Most alcoholics have, a pretty bad, have to be pretty badly mangled before they really commence to solve their problems. What is the only reason that some people will not do these steps? They haven't suffered enough pain. They just have not suffered enough pain. And if you're out there and you've suffered, and if you're out there and you're in pain, you don't have to suffer anymore. If you're out there and you're suffering pain, we have suffered it too. Come and join us and stop that cycle of dieting with group support And let us take you through the big book, and you'll have that spiritual awakening as a result of these steps if you continue to work them every day of your life. It is the most glorious way to live in the world is with these steps. Many doctors and psychiatrists agree with our conclusions. One of these men, staff member of a world-renowned hospital, recently made this statement to some of us. What you say about the general hopelessness of the average alcoholic's plight is, in my opinion, correct. As to two of you men whose stories I have heard, there is no doubt in my mind that you were 100% hopeless apart from divine help. Had you offered yourselves as patients at this hospital, I would not have taken you if I had been able to avoid it. People like you are too heartbreaking. Though not a religious person, I have profound respect for the spiritual approach in such cases as yours. For most cases, there is virtually no other solution. Now, what does he have to tell me here? There's no other solution. I have to stop looking for the diet. I have to stop looking for the food plan. I need a food plan. I have a food plan. I have to stop looking for the magic coin, the magic amulet, the magic wand that's going to fix me. Once more, now they've told this to us many times, once more, the alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink, except in a few rare cases, neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense, his defense must come from a higher power. Now, in closing, I just want to say that I have been a member of Overeaters Anonymous for 35 years. 
have lost a little over 500 pounds since the very beginning. I, I, I weighed a little over, quite a bit over 700 pounds. I recorded a 513-pound uh, weight when I was in my 20s. Um, this has been, though, the most glorious, glorious way of life for me. I've lost a little over 500 pounds. My current abstinence is 15 years. I have 15 years, almost 16, of freedom from compulsive overeating. This is the most wonderful way of life that there is in the world. Now, you may be saying to yourself, I never weighed that much or I never went to those depths. Maybe your hell wasn't the weight that I achieved. Maybe your hell was different. But it's hell. And if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if there's anything I could invite you to do, it's to live in God's grace. Take God's hands. Get a sponsor. Work these steps out of the big book. There's no other way to do them than out of here that's going to be effective for you. And join us in that broad highway, and we will surely meet some of you as we trudge the road of happy destiny. And I hope that I know that God will bless you and keep you until then. Okay, Leah, that's about all I got on Chapter 3. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Fantastic, Harlan. Thank you for your thorough and uh, insightful be of Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. And we're going to offer Harlan's contact information at the conclusion of this. But remember, please, I can't get international calls. I'm just okay. to jack my rates through the ceiling. Okay, so okay. we will make that clear. Thanks, Harlan. Okay. And now we're going to open the floor for any questions you might have regarding Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. And you can do so by pressing star 1 to unmute and identify yourself, please. Who has a question for Harlan? This is Jean. I have a question and a comment. Okay. Jean, thank you. Go ahead with your question. Um, I've been abstinent a lot of years and i um, very impressed with your story. I, my top weight was 280, but I knew, I knew in my heart that I could be because we have the propensity in my family for those kinds of uh, ways. And um, this was the most moving reading. A lot of years I've read this over and over again, and it's like really different hearing it from another perspective and going through it. So it's like I have a lot of ad, I have a lot of moderate, moderate, you know, admir, admiration for you, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And they. One of these things, it says that scientifically it couldn't be proved. And I think today it is scientifically proved. Mm-hmm. And I think yes. it's proved by the food. Mm-hmm. There are some people predisposed. And uh, I wonder what your um, your feelings are about this. We have an inherited I, I don't want to get into outside issues, Gene. I don't want to get into scientific proving of, of this or that. It's an allergy of the body and a, and a twist of the mind, and it's described in the doctor's opinion. And I believe that there is no greater proof than the doctor's opinion in the big book of AA. Um, so I, I really don't want to get into outside issues or outside uh, science at all on this. I just want to keep it uh, within, the, within the confines of the tradition. All I know is it works, and I've been doing it, it a long time, and I have a lot of admiration for you, and I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you, Jean, for the question. Thanks so much. Who's next? Questions for Harlan? Star one to unmute. Sarah W. Sarah, your turn. Go ahead. Hi, I have a. My name is Nancy. I have a question. Okay, Nancy, you'll be after Sarah W. Please, thank you. Thank you. I'm in good company. Thank you so much, Harlan, for your service today. Beautiful, and thank you, Leah, for your service always. Um. Sarah W. Grateful Recovered Compulsive Reader. Thinking about, you know, abstinence and not getting into food plans. But I think a lot of people, um, you know, I, I started my recovery in Phoenix, Arizona, by the way, and thank you. Thank you, Arizona. It, it was so <laughs> fun. But um, huh. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think a lot of people think that their abstinence is stagnant. 
And, you know, then they get into the shame thing. I think you know where I'm going with this. But, you know, a lot of times, and, and Lori C. talks about it too, but, you know, sometimes we get to a place where we realize that certain foods create an issue for us, and then we have to kind of tweak it a little bit. And I think a lot of people get into shame mm-hmm. about that. And I was wondering if you could, uh, if possible, address that just a little bit so that we can see that it's, you know, this thing about perfection, there is no such thing. At least that's where I come from today. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. What, what I what I strive for is doing my higher power's will and mm-hmm. looking for ways that I can be of service to others and keeping my food clean, but it's not about perfection. because I Thank you, Sarah, is- for your question. Thanks. Thank- Let's Thank keep you. it to questions. Thanks so much. Um, I think the only step I have to work perfectly is one. I- I'm not quite sure what the question was there. Do I think that we have to be perfect? I think the only step I have to work perfectly is one. And I do have to constantly review my intake of food, review my food plan. Uh, because as I age and as my activity changes, then these things need to be reviewed. Okay. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Nancy, your turn. Question, Hi. Please. Can Thank you hear me? Do you Perfectly. hear me? Yeah. Yep. Go right ahead. Okay. I have I have problems with unmuting on this phone. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good, say hello and thank you so much. My uh, I still have the notes from the um, a conference that I went to, and you explained the uh, it was a big book study, and I still have those notes. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. You don't know how much you've helped me. Uh, my question is, how do you feel about uh, your opinions on sponsors dropping people because they are not uh, they are unable to get abstinent? I like your opinion on that. Okay, I'm not a big believer that you can't get abstinent. I'm not a believer in can't. I know that there's will and won't, and I respect will and won't. But if a person will not put down the food, it says in the big book to drop them. It says in the big book to leave them alone. You may spoil a future chance. I understand that I'm not perfect. I understand that I'm human too. But if a person will not put down the food, the kindest thing you can do for that person is leave them alone. The, when, when, their, when their sobriety is more important to me than it is to them, that is the alanonic condition in its active form. There's nothing in the big book that says we continue to try to chide them, beg them, bribe them, browbeat them into an abstinence. If you don't want to put down the food, I will be in the, I'll be in the um, arena of waiting to serve you. I will be in the, in the ball game of trying to sponsor you, but not while you're eating. Not while you're eating. And sometimes people need to reach after seven. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for that question. Who's next? Blair, it's Diane from New Hampshire. Diane, it's your turn. Go ahead. Hi, Helen. Hi, Diane from New Hampshire. <laughs> Helen, I just wanted to let you know that I have a tape of, uh, this is a comment, not a question. Um, okay. I just want to let you know that I have a tape of a talk you did in um, New Jersey. And, oh, okay. Uh, All right. I listen to you every day <laughs> <laughs> on the way to work and on the way home, which is a, oh. almost an hour trip. And I can okay. thank you enough for the service that you do and that you're changing my life. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you very much. It's very heartwarming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. Who's next with a question? Let's make great use of this time with questions, please. Star one to unmute. Hi, this is Frida. Hi, Frida. Go ahead. Hi, Frida. Hi, Harlan. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, You know, you mentioned about the willingness. I'm struggling with putting the food down, and you talked about how important it is to do the steps. And my question is, you know, I've I've read in the doctor's opinion how you have to put the food down first before you could do the steps. Mm-hmm. But it seems to me that I can't put the food down just on my – I don't have the willingness. And so do you start <laughs> doing steps? first and then eventually no. no when you're willing and you can put the you haven't suffered enough pain yet 
the only reason you're going to put the food down is when the pain becomes insurmountable and you cannot live the way you're living anymore. You're not at that point. You're not ready. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you're a bad person, Frida. We love you. But the bottom line is, is that every OA room should have the have Dutch doors. Dutch doors are doors where the top and the bottom can be opened and closed independently of one another. And the top should be nailed shut. If you're not willing to crawl in and do whatever they say to do, you're not ready yet. And if you're not ready to put down the food, there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do. And we're not going to get you ready. It's going to be massive amounts of trauma, massive amounts of pain. And when you've suffered enough pain, you're, you're going to put the food down. Here's what has to happen before I put the food down. The fear of, of giving up the food, excuse me, the fear of eating had to outweigh the fear of letting the food go. The fear of eating had to overwhelm the fear of letting the food go. And while I was afraid to let the food go, nothing could take place in terms of recovery. So we'll be here, and we're going to love you, Frida, and we're going to pray for you, and we're going to love you. But when you're ready, we will welcome you with open arms. But until then, there's really nothing we can do for you. Thank you. My name is Thank you, Frida. Um, sorry, your name again, please. This is Cindy S. Yes, from New Jersey. And and then who from New Jersey? Cindy S. Cindy S. Okay. And, and questions. W. And Deborah yes. W. Okay. And questions only, please. Questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have recovered, and I was waiting three hundred pounds. And when I go to a AA meeting. I see people who weigh a lot of a lot of weight, like um, the whole weight, and I um talk to them about how I live my life, not eating food we do not eat, and I said I was talk to them. He didn't want to know how I eat my food, and. They say, I want to eat like you do, but they never talk to me, and I feel their pain. They say, how much good I do. They see how a lot, 100 pounds, but I try to wonder what I do. What else can I do? But I feel their pain. They tell it about two to 300 pounds, two month weight. What can I do? There's Thanks, three things Anne. you can do. There's three things you can do, Ian, for the person who's still suffering. You may want to write this down. Recover, recover, and recover. There's nothing you can do. When they have suffered enough pain from food, they'll come in or they won't. Most AA people that are in that situation love AA because they can not drink and be superstars. But a lot of the AA people that blow up in weight because they've transferred addictions is once they transfer that addiction, they just want to stay in the program that they're a superstar in or not. But that's not up to us to judge. There's three things you can do, Ann. Recover, recover, and recover. They have a God, and it's not you. They have a higher power, and it's not you. When they're ready, if they're ready, they'll come in. But you just keep working your program. Thanks, Ann. Thank you. Thanks for your You're question, welcome. Ann. Let's move on to Cindy S., please. This is Cindy. Can you hear me? Sure can. We can hear you only if you're from New Jersey. We can hear you. <laughs> I've been asked. My specific question is how do you apply the steps to relationships, specifically relationships that uh, uh, relation, romantic relationships and, how, uh, and also to mental health issues? I don't know how to apply them to mental health issues. I don't know that, that you know, I, I would be qualified to speak on either one of them. I went on my first date. I was 35 years old. Uh, I was married for 17 and a half years. I've been divorced for four years. Right now, I'm just getting my equilibrium back, and, and I'm in a relationship. But the bottom line is I, I'm as powerless over this other person as I am over food. I have to work the steps and work the traditions. And 
one of the things I have to remember is not to go outside my hula hoop, not to go outside my sphere. If you don't know what a hula hoop is, Google it. You're too young. I can't sit and explain it to you. But Google hula hoop. I don't go out of my hula hoop. And what's very, very important is for me every single day to absolutely be certain of my powerlessness over this other person, that they cannot become my higher power. Once this other person becomes my higher power, then I'm dead. Because any higher power I have that has skin, whether they're male, whether they're female, is not the issue. My higher power does not have skin. And when I'm sitting here shaking in my boots because somebody's mad at me or somebody's upset with me, or and I've done something to them, yes, absolutely, I make my amends. There's no question about that. But this person, they're going to have their emotions. This person is going to have their ups and their downs, and I don't have to take that on. And if I'm shivering in my boots because they're upset with me and I've done nothing to them, then they have at that moment become my higher power. And if they are my higher power, I am certain to eat because I will never be able to rein them in and for them to do what I want them to do 100% of the time. It's not going to happen. And that is the character defect of selfishness. Selfishness is my insatiable desire to write the script for the person. It's not going to happen. So I don't know if that explains it. I'm not really versed in relationships. I happen to be at the very beginning of one now, um, and I'm thrilled to be in it. It's fantastic so far. But the bottom line is is that as far as the mental health things go, this I can, I'm not qualified to speak on. Absolutely, I'm not qualified to speak on that. That's an outside issue. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Cindy, Jen. for the question. Cindy, Deborah sorry. W., your turn. Oh, I, I think it's, I said Becca W. Oh, Becca, yes, go ahead. Becca. Hi, Becca W., recovered in Maryland, Harlan. Thank you so much. It's so good to hear your voice. Um, I'm wondering, what are some things that you do to work Step 11? Thanks so much. Well, every day I do pray and meditate, and I do, I do take my um, daily guidance, and this comes from the Oxford Group principle of taking your daily guidance. And I go through step 11 every night, and I answer the questions. And in the morning, I do the upon arising section, and I ask God uh, for guidance in everything that I do. But I also say prayers that are not, you know, in the book. I say prayers because it says I'm supposed to do that. And I do meditate every single day. I, I do try to clear my mind as best I can. And I work step 11, and one of these days I'll come back and we'll do a whole thing on step 11 here on a vision for you if Leah wants me to. That's perfectly fine. And we'll see how in working step 11, I'm actually going to be working steps 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. I dare anybody on this phone, I dare you, I dare you to work 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 every day for the rest of your life and eat Kit Kat bars. You can't do it. You can't. You won't want them. We won't be able to shove them down your throat. So I do take my daily guidance every day, and I do meditate every day. Thanks, Becca. Yes, thanks, Becca, for that question. And, of course, Thank we'll you. get you on the calendar, Harlan. Yes, okay. who's next? Thank you. Carol G. Minky, and I didn't catch the other name. Carol G. Carol G. Okay, Minky, your turn. Hi, Helen. Good morning. Thank you for your service. Um, Thank you, This is not a question on step three, but I needed some clarity um, on step ten, if you can help me out with that. Um, I keep having the same resentment come up over and over and over with um, my 16-year-old teenager, and I'm not sure if God hasn't seen fit to lift my character defects yet, or if there's some more clarity that, because I followed it as you um, explained it, and it just doesn't seem to get lifted as, um, and I, you know, I'll do it and it'll get lifted for a day or two, and then the resentment just creeps back in. Mm -hmm. I have to ask God for willingness to let it go. There is a very, very high payoff to a resentment. We love resentment. That's why the book is riddled with 
mentioning resentments and, and, and all these various things deal with resentments. Why? Because we love them. Oh, my God, we love a resentment. Give me a good resentment, and I'm happy as a baby. My God. Well, what's the payoff? I can abdicate responsibility for my life. I can shift the blame to my 16-year-old, and then I don't have to take any responsibility, and I can eat Kit Kat bars and blame it on them. Or I can be engaged in self-pity and blame it on them. Or I can be engaged in insane behaviors and thinking and blame it on them. So every single day, I have to remember that God presents me with 24 hours of, mo- of moments that I need him more and more. So I have to work step 10 again. But there's nothing in step 10 that says pick up that resentment again and look at it from a new way. Have you made your outreach call? Have you made your amends? Love and tolerance of others. Have you done the work? And if it comes up again, immediately ask for the willingness to let it go and then do another step 10. But I must ask God for the willingness to let this go. It's vital. And that's about all I got, Minky, but that's the key. That's the key to the whole thing. Willingness. Can't get away from willingness. Thank you, Minky, for the question. Let's go on to Carol G., please. Hi. uh, Thank you. It's Carol G. from England. Hello, Harlan. Hi, Carol. Um, How are you? Hi. I'm fine, thank you. Good to hear you today. That was wonderful. Um, I'm newly recovered, and I really don't want to distort this actual message. It's a beautiful message, you know, when I'm carrying it with a few incorrect terms. I just wondered, can the terms ego, disease, and mental twist be used interchangeably, or are they all something different? I don't know how people are using them in context. But the, uh, the the terminology of the big book is a mental twist. It talks about the peculiar mental twist, and it talks about the physical allergy, and it also talks about the mental blank spot. The term obsession or mental obsession is a term that Bill introduces us to in the 12 and 12, and he used it throughout his the rest of his life. But I try to stick to big book terminology. I used to use mental obsession, but what I use now is mental twist because I want to stick to big book terminology. But it doesn't matter whether you call it a Labrador retriever or a big black dog. The the result is the same. But sometimes what happens is I like to stick to big book terminology because what happens is people will misconstrue different words and different words will have different meanings to different people. So I try to stick to big book terminology. Thank you, Carol G. Thanks, for that Carol. Question. Anyone <clears throat> else? Questions for Harlan related to Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. Hi, this is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks, Harlan. I had a question uh-huh. for you. There's, um, you know, people who go through the steps while they're still eating, and they then they recover when they reach, like, step, some reach step five, some reach step nine, such, some reach step ten. So could you speak to that? Sure. I'm not a believer that people will recover while they're still eating. I am not a believer that this is a program that can be worked while you're drunk on food. I do not believe that you will do any type of fourth step or any type of any step with any clarity or honesty while you're eating. So if, I, if there are people out there that have recovered while they were eating, this is news to me. I don't know. I, I, I think I've seen people by the hundreds think that that has been the case. But their four steps, their fifth steps, their sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, they're just incomplete because of a lack of clarity. I cannot tell you what it looks like out the window of a person who has abstinence for, say, 15 years as I do. It's going to look very different for a person who's in the food. And it's hard to explain that to someone who's in the food. But you don't have to have 15 years of abstinence. You have to have a couple of days out of the food. And after a couple of days, once you begin the process, if you pick the food back up again, there's, it's, there's no sense to this. We have to go back to the beginning. And that's been, I've been very consistent on that position, very consistent. Why? Because that's what the big book tells me. 
the big book does not cite examples of people that are still drinking that recover. There's no stories. There's no instruction in the first 164 pages of any, any situation where someone is still drinking and they're recovering, not one. Thank you very much, though, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa, for the question. Anyone else? Tara. Tara. Anyone else besides Tara? I have a question. Yes. Uh, and your name? Mary. I think I came in with somebody. I'm sorry, your name again? Mary. Mary. Okay, so let's go Tara, and then Mary, it'll be your turn. Hi, Harlan. It was great to hear you again. Um, Thank you, Tara. I know. Um, it's, it's a beautiful morning here in, um, in the farm country. Anyway, I, I have someone who is willing to do the work or myself and um, want to, you know, try as hard as they can, and they're struggling to put the food down. Um, and I know that the solution is spiritual and that I, they need to work with other people they need to get out of their isolation and self-centeredness. Um, it seems to me that if I can get them through this, you know, the steps as, as quickly as possible, um, that they could, they would put the, the food down in a sense that they would be working with, you know, they would not be obsessing with themselves and thinking, mm -hmm. how can I get ease and comfort from food when, they're starting to feel this, you know, this connection begin to be forged and the, mm -hmm. uh, the excitement. So could you just, maybe you could comment on that? Okay. That I'm, I'm not a believer, Tara, that anybody can work the steps while they're eating. They must be willing to put down the food. And the way that they demonstrate their willingness to put down the food is by putting the food down. And in the, in the doctor's opinion, it says, it says, the only uh, remedy we have to suggest is entire abstinence. I must put the food down. There is no way to work the steps while the person is eating. And a lot of times the sponsor becomes more invested in the recovery than the sponsee. And the sponsor wants to drag them kicking and screaming through the steps while they're eating. But the person is demonstrating unequivocally that they do not want to work the steps because they're still eating. Again, I do not believe, this seems to be the theme of the day, but I do not believe that someone can recover and have a spiritual awakening as a result of anything while they're eating. I must put the food down. And when I put the food down, it doesn't have to be for a month or a year. It has to be for a couple of days and keep it down and then move them through the steps quickly. There's none of this one step a month, one, you know, Move them through quickly by taking them word for word through the big book. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Mary, your turn with a question. Can you hear, can you hear me clearly? Perfectly, yes. Mary, perfectly. Oh, great. Thank you so much for your share this morning and a vision for you. It's just so wonderful. But, Harlan, my question to you, it's about a resentment that I have been feeling and um, the analogy is um, that I want to give it is, you know, in the big book when it says, um, you know, about righteous anger. Be very, very careful about righteous anger. Mm -hmm. And even when I share that with friends who really say, uh, absolutely, they're allowed to be angry. But I'm just using that as analogy. So when I came to a vision for you, I know it's a big book step study. And it's not like one person says they are the leader and they're, they're telling us. But I find many times that people are, I hear people saying to me, uh, you are like this because this is what I do, so therefore you do this. And this is what you should do instead of staying in their experience, strength, and hope. So I just wanted to share that with you is how to go about so I could have peace and overlook that because um, I'm surely not perfect and I really want to benefit the most. I don't know if you understand my question, but thank you. It, uh, what I'm gleaning out of that is you're, you're, you're talking about advice giving. 
And in the 12th step, it's a three, three-part step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And that's the first part, and it's very important. Second of all, it says, try to carry this message to the compulsive overeater who still suffers. The message is the big book. I'm not here to give you marital advice. I'm not here to give you advice. One time, and this is true, one, t- uh, one time somebody called me up last month and asked me if they should stay their pet. Uh, I've been called several times to ask me, should I divorce my wife? Should I divorce my husband? Should I change jobs? Should I move from Pennsylvania to New Jersey? Should I, how in the world do I know? How in, how in God's name do I know? We're not here as healers. We're not here as nutritionists. We're not here as uh, marital counselors, financial advisors, or anything like that. I don't know what you should do in those areas. I've got a full-time job living my life. I don't know. The one thing I'm qualified to know is how I work the steps. And I can share with you, if I sponsor you, what my life was like, what happened, and what it's like now, and go through the big book with you and tell you my hope, strength, and experience, and anything that I've ever said to anyone in or out of OA that is not verifiable in the big book, I encourage you to ignore me. I, in, I implore you to ignore me. I'm just another human being. And no matter how evolved my recovery gets, I will never rise above the level of a human being. So I am not qualified to give you advice. But thanks, Mary. I hope that answers it. I hope that was Thank the question. You. Okay. Thanks, Mary. For the question. Who's next with the question? Kim in Texas. Hi, I'm Deb. I have a question. I hear Deb. I hear, was that Kim in Texas? Kim in Texas, yes. Kim in Texas. Massachusetts. Sarit from Canada. Sarit from Canada, I hear. Who else do I hear? Iona from Massachusetts. Iona. Okay, so let's go Deb. Okay, Okay, so we're going to start with Deb, and then we're going to move on to Kim from Texas, and we'll take it from there. Go ahead. Hi, Harlan. Thank you so much for your share today. Um, Thank you. I I guess I've been thinking about the whole um, abstaining from um, compulsive overeating and just the fact that, that, um, you know, leaving drinking is pretty clear cut. You know, you just Mm -hmm. don't ever drink again, but since you have to eat, Mm-hmm. Um, and and I and I don't know that this is a, a question you can answer. It may more be just something you know that I'm thinking about. Is you know that absence there's more, so seems there's more ambiguity. Defined. Yes, there's exactly. more ambiguity. That's the word you're looking for. There's more ambiguity yeah. in the food, and food plans do change. One of the big advantages, uh, and I am I am definitely coming back in my next life as an alcoholic, but. For, uh, yeah. for reasons which we won't go into now. But the bottom line is, is and I don't want to con- uh, enlighten you later, but the bottom line is is that um, there is ambiguity and it does change. And what's abstinence in 1993 for me is not abstinent today. And what, the, what was abstinent in 2002 is not abstinent for me today. I have to review, and that means I have to weigh myself, and that means I have to take stock of where I'm at on a regular basis and make changes at times. Um, so what you're asking me is it's not as clear cut. You're right. It's not. And that's why I have to go to somebody that knows what they're doing. Not somebody sitting next to me in the meeting that knows what I should eat and what I should not eat and in what amounts. And so this is, this is a basic difference in, in narcotics anonymous, cocaine anonymous in gamblers anonymous in alcoholics anonymous, whatever it is, you're either doing it or you're not. Um, but there is some ambiguity here, and you just have to work within the parameters of asking God to tell you what's right and not give it the finger, not tell it to shut up, not tell it to shut up, because there's foods that work for us and foods that clearly do not. And what we've been doing all our lives is giving God the finger and saying, I'm, I know it doesn't work, but I'm going to eat it anyway. But thanks for your question, Deb. Thanks for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Thank no you, problem. Deb. Kim from Texas, your turn. Thank you so much, Leah and um, Harlan. I just want to piggyback on just what you just said, but my question, or um, I'm asking for your opinion, um, Mm -hmm. if you come from a recovered state and you get into a period of compulsive eating or relapse, however you want to um, call it, 
And Uh you have to redefine what abstinence is with the help of your higher power. My question Mm -hmm. is, can I get right back into 10, 11, and 12, meaning I – Day one, day one of abstinence, day one, mm-hmm. can I now say one, two, three, in my quiet time, I can't, God, you can, I'm going to let you, 10, 11, and 12, meaning four through nine. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just would like your opinion on that. Okay. Day one. Let's recover- take a look, Kim. Let's take a look, Kim, at relapse, and let's reverse what we've been looking at for decades you know, in, in OA. The food goes in the mouth probably 120 days after the relapse began. The relapse began when you stopped doing 10 steps. The relapse began when you stopped doing 9 steps. The relapse began when you stopped doing 10 and 11 every day and 12. So we must go back all the way to the beginning. There's no reason you can't do 10, 11, and 12 while you're doing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, whatever it is. But what we're looking for is a hall pass. And the hall pass says, because I've been here before, I can now skip the 10, 11, and 12 and call it good. No. There have been resentments and fears and sexual harms done others that you must clean out. And I'm not here to give you a homework assignment I'm not here to give you a homework assignment. I'm here to tell you this is what my opinion is since you asked me. If there are enough buildup and I'm eating, why would I want to take a shortcut? What would be my motivation for trying to circumvent the work that I know damn well needs to be done? I don't want to live in the Kit Kat bar. I don't want to live in the pizza. I'm going to do whatever it takes. But I appreciate your question. Thank you, Kim. It's now your turn. Sarit, I think we have, or Sarit. I'm sorry, Sarit. 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 And then uh, hi. Do you hear me? Yes, Sarit, go ahead. Speak up a little, please. Hi, Helen. Thanks so much for your share. I'll speak up. Um, I just have a quick question. I've been hearing a lot recently about people who are recovered stating that they're now living in 10, 11, and 1. And 10, 11, and 12. No, I'm hearing a lot of people say now they live in 10, 11, and 1. Maybe, I guess you haven't heard that. And um, No, I haven't. I'm just Thank God. Oh, okay. What's your Tell take? that one not to come out to Scottsdale, Arizona, please. <laughs> Hasn't been there yet. All right, Thank okay, God. that was my question. I've never heard of such a thing before, and it used to be Me 10, either. 11, and 12, so. Okay, that, I, I don't know. We're, we're out here in the desert, so I don't know. This is one that hasn't made it out here yet. Okay. Thank you, Sarit. Oh. Thanks, Sarit. Iona. Yes. Iona from Boston, Massachusetts, the West Inner Group, the West Region Inner Group. How are you? Where is she? Oh, thank you so much, Harlan. I'm doing great. Thank you. Good, good. Okay. Um, really a pleasure to be on this morning and, and get this review. I have a question. Working with someone who has struggled with absence for a long time, she's been in a way a long time, and um, she has been willing to put the food down. Mm-hmm. Um, so spending time with her at the beginning in the in the forwards and in the doctor's opinion, mm-hmm. um, what point do I move her forward? Will we both know when it's time to move forward? If she's got a couple of days of abstinence, move start right then. Okay. There's no reason to wait. What are we waiting for? We're going to wait for the Kit Kat bars to tackle her from behind. No, got it. we want to start moving right away. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to hear your voice. Yours too. Hi, this okay. is Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, Harlan. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Linda from New Jersey. Go ahead, um, Linda. I have a sponsee that um, was abstinent but then is not. And okay. um, I have persuaded um, them to find a nutritionist because I suspect the food plan that they're on is, is, is really not a, a good thing for them. Um, now, we hit step three, and I'm just wondering – 
he hasn't been able to get to the nutritionist yet. Should I just hold back? I mean, um, is I'm he just eating? Is he in the food? Is he in the food? Yes, yes. yes. Well, then there's nothing. You, there's no. There's no. This seems to be the theme of the day. There's no taking him anywhere until the food he's been emancipated for a couple of days. Okay. And even though it may be difficult. And you, you have to understand that when they put down the food, they're going to be feeling their feelings. You know, that when, right. when you're told as a little kid, uh, don't eat so much, you'll feel better. Ooh, they were right. You're going to feel anger better, fear better, crushes better, jealousy better, self-pity better. You're going to be feeling lots and lots of things way, way better. And as such, we need to start moving them through as quickly as we can. It takes a couple of days, and you're ready to roll. There's no reason to hesitate, none whatsoever. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Linda, for the question. Anybody else? Let's Hi, my name is Hi this is Annie. Whoa, okay. I hear Leslie. I hear Annie. Who else was there? Shannon. And Linda. Shannon. And who's the last one there? Linda. Linda. Okay, Leslie, you're up. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you, Harlan. Um, I'm a Chicago girl, and I hey. used to go to Swedish Covenant. Hey, me too. So, me too. Well, I know, because I saw you there. <laughs> um, and what I want to ask today is um, if you're working with someone that is, quote, a high bottom person, they aren't ex- haven't experienced misery, the million diets, um, but they they can give up the food. Um, can they still make it through this program, would you say? I don't see why not. They may not be compulsive overeaters, but they can yeah. certainly work the steps. There's a lot of non-compulsive overeaters that come in. Um, they've been convinced that their life would be just fabulous if they lost a couple of pounds. And they know somebody that was here or they heard about it and they mm-hmm. come in and they love it because they can talk for three to five minutes and we don't tell them to shut the front door. We don't tell them they're crazy. We hug them. We hold their hand. We pray with them. We socialize with them. They love it. But they're not compulsive overeaters. And there are many, many of them in meetings today. And they're not like we, should, we shouldn't like beat them with sticks or anything. But we have to understand that just because you're sitting in an OA meeting doesn't mean you are a compulsive overeater. And the person may not be one. Um, but we don't sit and judge. We just do the work. We just do the work. Um, okay. Thank you, Leslie. And it was good to hear your voice. Now I can picture you. Now I know who you are. Okay. Hello. Your turn, Annie. Annie. Annie going once. Annie going twice. Hi, can you hear me? It's Annie. I'm sorry I was muted. Go ahead. We hear you. Um, thank you so much for your service. What a powerful chapter and a powerful share. I My question is when you bring sponsees through the steps for the first time, you know, once they put down the food, um, I mean, I consider it, like my sponsor says, um, taking a breath while going underwater because I'm so clear about the mental twist and feeling my feelings for the first time. I'm wondering if there is, like, a plan of action, like, using the steps to work the tools. Like, I'm a firm believer that it's not the meetings I make, it's the steps I take. However, I do go to three meetings a week to work the steps. And I'm wondering what you did during your first round of the steps, uh, you know, to get that spiritual experience. And also, if you could just speak a little on the 10 step promises, you know, something that we can all be inspired from and how that that's worked in your life. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave the, the promises for another time because that's going to take us out of our time parameter for sure. But I just worked the steps out of the big book and I wish I had some more esoteric answer for you. I worked the steps out of the big book and in working the steps, the tools take care of themselves. And I'm certain that in a laboratory somewhere in a basement in, in somewhere, there are somebody coming up with three more tools so we can have 12 tools. And I'm sure they're knocking themselves out. I think that we focus too much on the tools. Uh, it, I think we, we look at the tools and we say, well, I'm working the tools. I'm working the tools. Well, if we're not working the steps, then it's, it's, it's not going to, recovery is not going to happen. 
So, um, but I, I would rather save the promises for another time when we have when we have a more protracted time frame to cover that. Thanks. Thank you, Annie. Let's go to Shannon, please. Shannon. Shannon. Star one to unmute. Hi, this is Shannon. Hi. Go ahead with your question. Um, I have a newcomer, and they are having uh, diabetic issues, and uh, that's I don't know what to do with that. They want to work the program, but are having issues. I I, I wouldn't know what to do with that either, Shannon. I really don't. I I don't know anything about diabetes, and I'm not a physician, um, so I really don't know how to address that. Um, Is there anything more specific? Um, And by the way, it was a lot of crashing during the day. And um, so I and I have been to the doctor. I just perhaps what I'm feeling is not ready, medically okay, not ready. I don't ready. know. I don't know. I, I really don't. I, I don't. It's a have hard a clue. one. I don't know what to do. Yeah, I don't either. It was great to be with you guys though last weekend, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. Good this to hear you. It was awesome, voice, Harlan, and I have a car Thank for you. you. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. All right. I got you. Okay. Good. All right. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, you'll talk one-on-one about that, let's say. All right. I'm okay. sorry. Well, I'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to go to Linda. Sorry about that. Yeah, Linda. Your turn. Linda, star one to unmute. Okay, there I am. Hello. Good morning, Ms. Linda. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Linda. Okay. Um, you know, this morning was the first time that I've ever heard that you only had to have the food down for a couple of days to work through the steps. And um, mm-hmm. that has given me so much hope. And mm-hmm. I'm, I have a difficult time finding someone to work the steps with me without being like a, a length have a length of abstinence under my belt Mm -hmm. um so you know and another thing that i've um so i'm going to work looking look for someone to do that with me but um another thing that i have um a question about is the dignity of choice with your food plans i'm finding that my sponsors are requiring you to eat exactly what they eat in order mm. for them to respond to you. And mm. um, so, you know, my choice is to, you know, see a nutritionist. And so mm-hmm. if I if I find a sponsor to call, you know, so that how do you call in your food when you're eating what the nutritionist is telling you to eat? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm trying to get at? I just, if I don't I, I food, don't I don't call in my food. I discuss different things with my sponsor, but that isn't one of them. That's too boring of a subject for me. And if you have a sponsor that absolutely insists that you eat the same way they do, I would question that sponsor's recovery. Um, I would seek out a sponsor that you can work with. Uh, It sounds to me like that's ridiculous to uh, insist. What What if you're diabetic, but the sponsor's not? What if you're vegan and the sponsor's not? What if you're kosher and the sponsor's not? So, there's very, very, uh, it, it, this sounds very crazy to me, but I, I wish I could answer your question better, but I would seek out another sponsor. Uh, when you walk to God, he'll run to you. You seek out someone else and it will occur, it, it will happen for you. If you cannot find what you are looking for in your local area, then get in touch with some of us throughout the country and we can do the best we can to sponsor you by phone. It can be done. It is done, and it can be very successful, but, you know, uh, that's, that's my thought on it. Thank, Thank you, Linda. you, Linda. I hope we, t- we covered it for you. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes left here. Who else has a question related to Chapter 3, more about alcoholism? 
Anyone else? Star one to unmute. Hi, hi, it's Lisa. I had another question. Hi, Lisa. And let me just Tanya, I have a question. And Tanya, okay. Questions, please, related to Chapter Three. More about alcoholism. That's our topic this morning. Go ahead. Oh, and I was wondering, isn't it so that Dr. Bob took a long time to get sober and was in the middle of his steps when he got sober? No, Dr. Bob. Uh, got sober on June the 10th, 1935. He finally made his ninth step amends. But if he didn't take the first eight steps, forget about it. It wouldn't have happened. No, Dr. Bob got sober on June the 10th, 1935 and never drank again. He did not get sober the very first time he met Bill. He still had one more good drunk left in him. Um, but, um, yeah, but he had one good drunk and he went to the medical convention in Atlantic City in June of 1935, he returned, he completed his, he, he took the first eight, uh, and he completed his ninth, and that is the first day of uh, the history of AA. But was he still drinking during the first eight steps? No. Eventually, on the 10th of June, he put down the alcohol. On the and 10th then he of June, did his steps? No, he, was, he did his steps. Um, he, he had to be free of the alcohol before he was ready to move forward, and that's, that's the history that we have. He drank, the, he drank a couple days before he came home on the 9th, and Dr. and Bill poured him a beer to sh- settle his nerves down because he, had, he was shaking with DTs, and then he moved forward that day with the steps. He never drank again, until he, and he died in November of 1950. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Tanya, you, your Lisa. turn. Question Tanya. related to Chapter 3, Hi. about alcohol. Hi there. This is Tanya from New York. Hi, Tanya. Thank you for your share, Harlan. I really appreciate it. I got a lot out of it. Uh, question. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you know, I think it's a really common problem, and I'm sort of facing it right now, that I'm in Step 4, and, you know, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of resentment that I'm sort of sitting with and working through, and, and I, I like to procrastinate about it. And, and, I mean, I like to procrastinate about it and then beat myself up about it very much like mm-hmm. I used to do with the food. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the disease and, you know, procrastination around working the steps and how it's related. Mm-hmm. I think that if somebody is hesitating in four, they're really having a problem with two. I never look at four and nine as steps that when people are st- – struggling with them that they're actually struggling with four. You're not struggling with four. You're struggling with two. You have to see the need to do this. And if you see the need to do this, if you really have a higher power, Tanya, in your heart that you were willing to believe in, there's nothing in the book that says you must believe, you must be willing to believe, then you will continue on with the work and want to knock it out. There is no such thing in the big book as telling you that your fourth step must be perfect. Um, God is not going to hang your fourth step on his refrigerator. Get it done. But you're really in need of a review of step two. And what happens in a lot of cases is people see that we're talking about this God thing. God, God. They just be sick of it. They just overload on it. And they don't really see why I'm doing this work. What is resentment? What is fear? What is sexual harm to another? What does that have to do with Twinkies? What does that have to do with French fries? Well, everything. But we're, we're not getting sponsors. We're not getting the knowledge that it takes so that we understand the connection. We're not getting that the only way out is to have a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps. Now, we've already talked this morning, Tanya, about the fact that we have a twist of the mind that drives us into the food in search of the effect. And we have an allergy of the body that makes it impossible for us to stop. Well, let's consider this for just a minute. What if I could find a way to live where my brain doesn't lock in on the sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly from eating a Kit Kat bar? What if I could find a way to live where I don't want the food? What if I could find a way to live where eating that food is the furthest thing from my mind? And that process of bringing God into that equation is called recovery. Recovery. To return that which has been lost. We're going to go back to the spirit that created us. 
And in so doing, the desire for this food will leave us forever. Well, not forever. It will leave us, and we will get the effect of the steps, which will circumvent the, te- the effect of the food, because we won't eat the food. We'll have the effect of the steps, thereby rendering the physical allergy temporarily useless. You have to see the need for the spiritual awakening. You're not struggling with four. You're struggling with two. So I appreciate the question. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you, Tanya. And that's a great place to wrap up this morning. Carla, we thank you so much for your time this morning and service to all of us here on A Vision for You. And I'm going to close with the reading from page 164, the way we always close up shop here on A Vision for You. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then.